Good. Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to the Common Area Level 5 Maintenance Task uh, Maintenance Town Hall. Uh, thank you all for coming. This is quite a crowd, so we appreciate you being here. Uh, hopefully you'll get a lot out of the presentations that will be given to you in just a minute. If I could ask you uh, to silence your cell phones, that'd probably be good just to remember to do that. I have to be reminded of doing that. My name is Dan Leniger. I'm the president of HOA2. Uh, I'll kind of go down the row here since we've got just one microphone for this in. Mark Eckert, sitting next to me, is the vice president. Matt Kambick, assistant treasurer. Denise Lexell is director. And Chuck Hill, director and secretary. Uh, Walter, why don't you introduce the group to your right, um, and then we'll have the introductions done. All right. Thank you, Dan. I'm Walter, I'm the general manager of HOA2, and next to me are four members of the original common area task force that was formed back in 2020 or 2019, in 2019. So um, I have Marlene Bor Borland, I have Lynn Denning, I have Art Kopchak, and I have Eileen Depka to my right here. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for all of the work you have done um, since 2019. They've been together on this subject since 2019, which is an incredible amount of time and effort uh, by this group into this subject of common area maintenance. So thank you all for doing that, and thank you for being here and getting the band back together again. I want to tell you, just before I give it over to Walter, because this is really Walter's town hall, I want to say to you that I look back on a lot of agendas that have happened since transition, and you all know we transitioned January 1, 2018. This topic, maintenance, common area maintenance topic, is second only to budgets in the amount of time and effort that people have put into work, presentations, gathering comments from homeowners. It's, it's an incredible subject. Uh, it obviously has lots of interest because you guys are willing to come on two o'clock in the afternoon to hear about it. It's, it's really good. And so there's been a lot of effort put into that. Let me just take you back a little bit though. In 2022, um, there had the, the common area maintenance um, plan has been in place for really since 2020. Boards prior to 2022 did not fund that plan to any great degree for level five. They funded it for the other levels, but they didn't really fund it for level five. 2022, the board 2022 funded level five work. And that was a big process, went through a lot of conversation uh, during the budget, budget time. In 2023, this board, then took up the, the work of actually implementing that level five activity. And we went through a lot of process. We ended up with a motion in March of 2023 to start work on level five activity, which included hiring people, which included buying equipment, all those kinds of things. In June, stuff started. So things started to happen. And at that point in time, there became concerns from obviously homeowners like yourself and probably, you're, I'm guessing you're here, but people had concerns. So we paused that work in late June and said, hey, we need to answer those questions. We need to understand, make sure we've covered all our bases, make sure homeowners understand the answers to the questions they're raising. At that point in time, the board asked Walter and his staff to look at those questions that were coming up and dive into them and come up with some uh, thoughts and answers and, and uh, overriding discussion about those. And that now has culminated 
in this meeting today. So that gives you a brief background on where this has come from and where it's going. So I'm going to turn this over to Walter now, and he'll take us through the presentations, uh, both with himself as well as the uh, task force that has reconvened. So Walter, there you go. Thank you, Dan. All right, well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming out to the town hall. Um, appreciate you taking your time to come learn a little bit more about um, the common area maintenance effort that we've been going through. Okay, so um, you can see the agenda there. Uh, Dan has given you the introduction. I'm gonna go through a quick review and status update of what the staff has been doing and where we're at. And then at that point, I'm going to turn it over to members of the original task force, which I introduced earlier, and they're going to address more specifically these questions that um, the board and I received from the community. Okay, so it's been a challenge to handle this level five. Well, once we defined it as level five, that was the first process. Now it's been a challenge to actually get to the point where we implement it. And I'm not gonna run through this too long because Dan just did that for me, so. Pretty awesome. He got you all the way down to, you know, um, 2022. Well, let me start with uh, 2021. The task force developed a policy and maps. So that's what I'm gonna show you on the next slide is these maps that were developed. Okay, then in 2022, um, again, the board built the budget for this year, 2023, to implement level five. And so we were excited and we took off on June you know, the first week of June, and then we started receiving concerns and notes from the residents. And so by the end of June, we decided to halt operations and take a look at all of this information that you've been sending us. And we've collected that, and then we passed it over to the task force. Okay, so back to my mention of the map. So there was a map developed, which basically takes every piece of land in Saddlebrook and tells us what level of maintenance there is. So we've got level of maintenance from level one all the way to level six. But today we're specifically discussing level five. So this was developed. Now in addition to the big map, which you can hardly see up here, we developed for each unit these detailed maps. And we handed those out when we got done, we handed each, each um, unit representative got a whole set of maps that looked like this with details that showed you, you could get a copy of those and you could see behind your house what this looked like. Now what you're looking at here may be a little bit hard to see, but right behind your wall, you can't see there's a green line that represents the eight feet. Now after the eight feet, I'm shaking here, there's the orange or kind of a dark yellow. That's the level five we're talking about today. And beyond the level five, you'll see there is plenty of level six, which is a different level of maintenance, which is very minimal. So these maps were given out to the community at the time for your review. Now also, let me go into what we as a staff showed the board. Now, let me tell you, this was before we received, before we received any equipment or much funding, but the board said, how do you expect this level five to look? So we took the common area folks out and said, okay, according to the policy that was written, show us an example of how level five should look. So we, we got two examples. The top example is between houses. When you have a house and a back wall here, you have some space and you have another house with their back wall. So that was the example that we showed the board. Now the bottom example is an example of a sloped hillside behind a house where you can see it comes, it's pretty overgrown. We come in, we take out that overgrowth, we trim up the trees, and in many cases it goes down to the cart path. Other areas do not back up to the golf course, so we'll go out 30 feet. So that's what we showed the board as a staff saying, okay, this is what we think we can do. And that's before we got funding or equipment. That was our best effort to match the policy. Okay, so now level five, if you look at level five, level five is actually 
124 acres, which is only 7% of Saddlebrook. So it's, very, it's a very small section in terms of percentage. But in, in order to our effort with the four-man team or whatever, it's, it's a large area for a four-man team to take care of. Now, with the level five, with this um, 124 acres, how are we going to attack that? Because our goal is to make it where we get through this every year, a one-year cycle. So that's the goal, is to hit this level five every year. We figure that 60% of this area we can get to with machinery, some type of mechanical help to make this go quicker. And then there is actually a 40% of this level five area that either too steep, we can't get the machine back there, and that's just gonna have to be manual labor. So that's what we presented to the board in 2022 as we were building the 23 budget. So the board, of course, approved us purchasing the piece of equipment and the mulcher that goes on it. And so that's what we started with in June in um, 2023 of this year. So I wanna show you where we started. We got working for about three weeks and I'm gonna show you what it looked like when we did it the, the first day we attacked it. And then I wanna show you what it looks like now today. So that's what these next slides are gonna be. Okay, so when we started out, we trimmed and we took the machine and we cleared you know, 30 feet past the wall. This first eight feet is just the standard eight feet and then a little bit farther you know, completes you know, the 30 foot swath. So you look at that and yeah, it looks kind of drastic. You're like, oh my gosh, that's drastic. You know? But again, we left the major things. We left trees, if there's ocotillos or cactus, we left the cactus. There wasn't much on this hillside um, we also, um, so that's how we approached it. Now this is what it looks like today, like two and a half months later. You can see the grasses and the shrubs are coming back. You can see where we left some of the stuff we mulched. Now something to see here, because we left that mulch there, we do not have any erosion. So I went and walked the, all the areas. I said, like, okay, you know, one of the concerns was erosion. So I walked through it. I said, okay, let's see if there's any erosion. And all the areas I walked, I did not see any erosion, and I think partly is because we left the items that we mulched. So it kept the soil in place, and it gave the grasses and the shrubs a chance to come back. Again, we're not going down taking roots out. We're just taking, you know, down to about six inches or so, and we're leaving the grasses there, and they'll come back. And this is what it looks like from the golf course looking up. Again, this is the east side of Mountain View Hole number three. So you're looking back at that residence there. Okay, I've got several more examples here. Now this is looking from the golf course over to the west along between hole number one and hole number two. So you can see that although we cleaned it out, there are a lot of cactus and other vegetation that we did not disturb along that hillside. A uh, more close up look, you can see here what it looks like. Now, some of these grasses aren't coming back as quick as that other picture, but they will come back. So that's hole number one and two. Now the south side of Mountain View, hole number two. This is the first day we did this area. And today, all this vegetation is um, coming back. So here's some, we left the, the, the mulching there. And here again is another picture of that area. Um, you can see that somebody here was probably doing something on their own because that's pretty bare, that's not us. Our look would be more like this where you leave the vegetation. So um, I'm assuming somebody before we got there did something. Again, that's one of the reasons we're trying to do this is so that behind the houses all look pretty similar in maintenance. All right, so now here's an area kind of where water drains off the golf course. It was nice and green. Again, we came through on the first day. A month and a half later, trees are nice and trimmed. Grasses are coming back. Everything is looking happy. If I could zoom in here, you would see a hawk flying right here. Um, as I walked around, 
I ran into deer, I ran into quail, I ran into birds sitting on the cactus. Um, there was no shortage of wildlife as I went to take pictures of all these areas that we have um, addressed here. And so that's my update of where it looks like. I mean, yes, when we first get there, it does look drastic. But after you give it some time, it's going to come back. Now you've got to imagine that we're only going to make it through here once a year. So we're going to come back and readdress it once a year. It's going to be grown up uh, to some extent, but not as much as it was because, I mean, it's been 25 years since anybody went to really touch a lot of these areas. Okay, so that's where we're at. How do we move forward? So we talked about all of the questions that were sent to us. We collected the items that needed to be addressed. Um, of course, each resident has their own opinion and wishes. So I can't address every single person's wishes. Um, was mentioned waterways and washes, concern there. Endangered species, endangered plants, and are permits required? All these questions were coming through these communications that you were sending to myself and the board. So my first question is, oh my goodness, you know, I know that this had all been looked at with the original board. So I don't think we were going wrong. So in my head, I had to say, what's the, is, are these questions valid? They're valid questions to ask. I said, am I breaking the law here? So how can I determine if I'm breaking the law or not? Um, so we need to review the federal, state, and county guidelines. Again, as we started down this road, I started hearing from many experts, but each expert seemed to have their own opinion, so it was like no one, it wasn't like a, as you talk to all the experts, that they came with one solid, one piece of advice. It was just different advice from different um, experts. So I couldn't get like a real solid, this is the way to go. Um, so now, once we consider all this, and after I receive comments, because I'm going to leave a um, link for you to leave comments, once I get comments from you and I get advice from the task force, I'll have to make a decision on how to adjust our procedures and move forward. So that's my plan for moving forward from here. Okay. So, I'm going to hand it over to the task force. Now, what I need you to do is to listen very carefully. They've got a lot of data. Some of it is very specific from different federal agencies. So, you need to listen, look at their sources, and I think they have the answers to a lot of those questions that were sent to us. So, I'm going to turn it over to Eileen and her staff, and we will take it from there. Okay. As Walter mentioned, my name is Eileen Depka. I am a member of the former task force, Common Area Task Force. Uh, since my husband and I moved here in, or bought our home in 2013, we've been very interested in, in seeing what upkeep looked like for the common area and have just been very much involved in, in uh, hoping and in, in looking towards uh, a good future for the common area. Um, What uh, we plan to do today is talk to you, the four of us, to talk to you about uh, several different things. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the Common Area Task Force and give you a little bit more background. Uh, we'll look at specifically what Level 5 is. Um, and Walter mentioned some things, we'll mention a few more. And then we'll look at responses to some key questions that we were given. Uh, we also will address and provide research according to some topics, very specific topics we were given to research. And we'll make some recommendations, uh, uh, including level five work, common area work, long-term success, and some recommendations for the HOA staff. Uh, I, I would just want to mention that we've been working on this for approximately two months. And during those two months, we probably have spent at least 200 hours worth of research. So what we're presenting to you today is the thing that, things that we could find from the best possible resources available for the questions that were offered uh, and asked. So as far as the Common Area Task Force is concerned, timeline, our first meeting was in January of 2019. And then we worked 15 months until we presented to the board in March of 2020. 
The policy was first approved in January of 2021, and then there were some adjustments made. It was reapproved in May of 2021. With each approval, there was a time for the community input. Okay, let's see here. We're working off of two different systems, so um, bear with me. So the common area task force, what, did, what were we supposed to do? Well, our charge was this. We were to recommend a policy. We were to allow a system for homeowner requests of common area. We were asked to review and suggest ways to reduce future costs. Uh, we were to develop cost estimates and work on development of maps that Walter mentioned earlier. And we were to make recommendations for ongoing administration so the policy would be enacted and continue. And then we also uh, were to recommend whether a standing committee would be valuable to have for common area tasks. So what we did then as a group, um, we conducted research on all aspects of the charge. Nine of us worked uh, a lot of hours to come up with information that was needed in order to do the charge that we were asked to do. We spoke with communities, different communities around us to learn of their practices. We completed or consulted uh, multiple resources and individuals knowledgeable in the areas contained within the scope of the charge. That included, but is not limited to, to people like the Scottsdale Fire Marshals, uh, Northern Arizona University, um, the University of uh, Arizona Personnel, Arizona Fish and Wildlife, and more. Um, we took and reviewed hundreds of photos, and you'll hear more about what those photos were used for in a little bit. Um, we walked miles of the common area to view current status and to look at what is compared to what could be or should be. We researched and made equipment and long-range planning recommendations, and then we also recommended some volunteer programs. So now let's take a look at what the policy itself says. So we're all on the same page and we have a common understanding of what it is for Level 5 within the policy. First, the crew is supposed to inspect uh, annually for dead plants, for trees, for trash, and remove those things. They're also to trim plants, to trim trees, to trim bushes, to spray and or remove noxious and invasive veg vegetation. They're to either remove debris or chip debris, and to remove pack rat nests. Walter mentioned this earlier, if we're gonna put level five into perspective, think about about 7% of the community. So we still have 93% of the community that we're not talking about today. So what specifically are the three levels or the three characteristics in level five? The first, those of you who have a wall in your backyard, an open area and a wall behind you, wall to wall maintenance in between there is considered level five. Uh, eight feet behind the wall is already done for you, but from eight feet to 38 feet is also level five common area. If you live on the golf course, things are a little bit different. Then from your wall to the cart path is level five. Or if you're on the opposite side of the fairway, from your wall to the nominal fairy, uh, uh, fairway is level five. So those are the specific areas of level five, nothing more, nothing less. So now let's get into what were the questions that we were asked to research and what was the information that we were asked to research. First of all, we were asked to say or to find out to what extent is the common area to remain a natural state or is the association required to control growth? Question number one. Question number two, could the work result in the removal of protected plants or impact protected animals? Question three. Are there any permits required for Pinal County or the state? And then we were also asked to take a look at washes, riparian and uh, ephemeral areas. Uh, are there any map adjustments needed for the maps that were done a few years ago? What about endangered species? What about identifying noxious and invasive plants, as well as species that really need to remain? So I'm gonna talk to you just about the, the first three questions and uh, respond to what we found in the research. So to what extent is the common area to remain a natural state or is the association required to control growth? 
So let's first take a look at the state statute. HOA is responsible for maintaining common areas, according to the state. Uh, HOA has the ability to regulate those common areas. Um, now, according to the Saddlebrook CCNRs, which also direct the board as to what to do, uh, they shall use a reasonably high standard of care in providing for the repair, management, and maintenance of the common area. They shall be the sole judge of what that common area should look like. Oh, I'm sorry. Two clickers. Okay, thank you. So let's go on from there. According to the HOA 2 policy, now I'm on, correct? Okay, thank you. Uh, to, we are to define, the, the HOA is to define how the common area of Saddlebrook Homeowners Association 2 will be maintained, the scope of that maintenance across varied landscapes, uh, the condition and processes necessary to carry out that maintenance. Then the goal is for, uh, to be maintained for safety, for sustainability, for appearance, uh, in each class of the vegetation being looked at. We at this point also look back at the 2015 uh, strategic planning survey. It was the newest information that we had that came from the widest number of people. And what we found is that three of the top four resident priorities really looked at we want this community to look beautiful. Uh, we want overall appearance to be good. We want the golf courses to be good. We want scenic views maintained or regained. While we were doing our research, there were a lot of fires going around the, the country. You know that. You know about the Lahaina fire in, um, in Hawaii and how awful it was. Well, while we were um, researching things, came across an article from Jennifer Balch, who is a scientist and the director of the Environmental Data, Data Science Innovation and Inclusion Lab in Colorado. And she brought up some interesting points. She said, wildfire boils down to three ingredients, a warm and dry climate, fuels to burn, and a spark. She goes on to talk about the importance of wind and how wind can really spread fire. And she also says that invasive species, particularly flammable grasses, push out native species. Well, our common areas are filled with invasive, invasive species, some of which are considered highly flammable. The growth has become out of control. Now, does that mean we're going to have a fire? Well, my gosh, I hope not. None of us can predict that. But we do have very similar circumstances to what they did in Lahaina. So is Saddlebrook a natural desert? That's part of the question. Well, this is actually Saddlebrook before Saddlebrook was built. It's kind of a neat picture, I think. But you can see there's no trees there. There are prickly pears if you get close enough. Um, there are lots of bushes. But the land is natural desert at this point. Uh, very limited vegetation. Now what ha has happened since then? The common area is no longer a natural desert. It's not a natural state and it doesn't need to remain as is. If you look at some of the pictures you can tell we water it. We have plowed it down to build new houses. We've built roadways and so on. And once that land is disturbed and homes are built, and irrigation systems are installed, the area could no longer be considered a natural state. This led to the uncontrolled overgrowth of noxious and invasive vegetation due to lack of maintenance. So if we look at the answer to that question one, we see that the common area is no longer a natural state. We also see that the association is responsible for care of the common area. So let's go on to question two. Could the work result in the removal of protected plants or impact protected animals? The first uh, place that I went to to take a look at protected animals was the Center for Biological Diversity. I narrowed it down to Pinal County where I found out that they have identified 24 species. Out of those 24 species, 16 of them live on or near water or in water. Uh, 
level five, we're not talking about any water. We are not impacting those 16 species. But there's another eight. At that point, I went to the US Fish and Wildlife Service after looking at all of the, the protected species. And the US Wildlife Service was, allowed me to narrow down Saddlebrook, and I could actually look just at Saddlebrook. And they said, well, there's eight potentially uh, endangered or threatened species there. Uh, five are, um, well, five species, three endangered cacti. So let's take a look at what they are. We have the Gila chub, the Mexican spotted owl, the monarch butterfly, the yellow-billed cuckoo. The work being done on level five should not impact any of these. Now, I'm not just making this up. I'm going to go on to tell you what the, the Fish and Wildlife says. As far as the ocelot, uh, we haven't been able to find any evidence that there are ocelot actually in Saddlebrook. So the Fish and Game then says that there are no critical habitats in Saddlebrook for any of the endangered species within Saddlebrook. So that's a major thing because it go, you'll find out later what kind of impact that has. Let's look though at the, the uh, cactus. The first, there are three that were identified as perhaps in the area. The first one is the hedgehog cactus, and we know for sure that that one does exist in, the, in Saddlebrook. And there is hedgehog cactus in the level five. The Turk's head cactus and the Acuna tax, cactus we have not seen, they still could be here. So we need to be careful. We need to make sure that we are caring for those um, species. So getting to answering that question, are the endangered or threatened wildlife in, uh, endangered in Saddlebrook? We are not a critical habitat. The answer to that is no. However, we have those cacti. Well, care definitely needs to be taken to avoid the three endangered cacti. It's, it's pro uh, the cac hedgehog cactus, we actually have a picture later on in the presentation from that cactus at the preserve. We know it's there. It needs to be cared for. The point, though, is that in the policy, all healthy cacti in level five do need to be cared for. We need to be careful of all of them. So in being taking care for all of them, we also need to take care of those that are endangered. So question number three, are there any permit requirements from Pinal County or the state? I bring this into the presentation because it was a, a, something that had been posted and people were looking at this online saying, Whoa, wait a minute, are we goofing up? Did we make a mistake? Were we supposed to get permits? This uh, blurb is from, uh, the, from Maricopa County. And basically it says, let me just look at the first part for you, landowners have the right to destroy or remove plants growing on their land, but 20 to 60 days prior to the destruction of any protected native plants, landowners are required to notify the Arizona Department of Agriculture. In our case, this does not apply because in level five, there was no intention of destroying native uh, protected plants. So I went to the Department of Agriculture and said, well, is there anything else we should know? Um, and in looking through the agriculture site, they said, you know what? We refer you to fish and wildlife. And whatever they says, say about your community is what we, we also accept. Uh, and as you know, the website has said that uh, we do not have critical habitats here. Uh, the, the last place that we went to to take a look at permits was Pinal County. So um, Mr. Ortiz was contacted and he is the deputy of public works in Pinal County. And he said that we are a developed community and a de developed community does not need permits unless a roadway is impacted. So with the state and with Pinal County, no permits were needed or are needed for work being done. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Art who will share more information about WASH's ephemeral streams and map adjustments. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Kopsack. 
My wife and I have lived in Saddlebrook II for about almost 20 years. And during that time, I served about 10 years on the facilities committee and was the project manager for the renovation of the Mountain View Club in 2014. And I've also served on the common area task force with the rest of the folks up here. But more directly related to my presentation, the fact that uh, I taught cartography, environmental science, topographic surveying, and other subjects at West Point, and was later the deputy district engineer for the Wilmington District South Atlantic Division of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In such capacity, well, there you go, thank you. In such capacity, the, uh, I had direct responsibility for the review, approval, and final sign-off of all 404 permits under the Clean Water Act and environmental studies and impact statements dealing with federal properties and also to endorse certain state environmental studies. Now that leads me directly into the US, the U.S. Clean Water Act. Recently, in May of this year, the U.S. Supreme Court made a decision in the Sackett versus EPA case dealing with the Clean Water Act. Uh, sorry. Dealing with the Clean Water Act. And specifically the 404 wetlands were dealt with in that decision. And more importantly, it's asserted that the jurisdiction over the, war, of the uh, 404 permit was greatly restricted. No longer could wetlands that did not have a direct connection to navigable waters of the United States be considered wetlands. More importantly, to make sense of this, Congress came up with a decision as to what was considered navigable waters. Well, the court clarified that to more uh, succinct explanation in that only the, the, this thing's going crazy on me. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, there we go. To make sense of this a little bit more succinctly, the, um, under the, the compass, exactly what that meant is that the bodies of water had to be geographically flowing into that area from the wetlands, into either lakes, streams, or oceans. As you'll see as we go back through this presentation, that has a pretty big input impact on our wetlands are actually what were considered at one time wetlands, but now are really not wetlands, but instead are free-flowing streams, ephemeral streams, or riparian areas. And speaking of riparian areas, those are the two areas that could possibly be considered here in Saddlebrook. Let's take a look at the ephemeral area first. The ephemeral washes are hydraulically connected and must be able to pass down to a further stream. Um, they rarely contain runoff. There are exceptions to that, and I'll point a very clear exception in a minute. Normally they just carry litter that happens to accumulate on the surface. And under the, this something's wrong with this. No, something's wrong with it. It's going bad. There we go. Let me click for you. It's, there's something going crazy on that. And I'll use my own pointer. I'd like to point out to you on this in that. In the riparian areas, there are in the excuse me in the ephemeral area, ephemeral stream areas, there are no riparian areas. 
That's by state law. And that law has been in existence for several decades. Let's take a look at the ephemeral streams that are here in uh, the Saddlebrook area. The first one, if you look in the upper right corner, upper left corner of the map, you'll see that there's one that's called an unnamed wash. It comes in from the uh, road to the, sub, uh, to the preserve down to the northwest section of the lower part of Saddlebrook. And if you go up in those uh, units, you will see a mostly concreted wash that flows, that comes down to the south, goes to the southeast down towards uh, Saddlebrook One. There is another terrain of, of here, it's uh, Canyon del Oro Wash, which is not within the Saddlebrook uh, boundaries. Go to the next slide. The next slide you have the second wash and an ephemeral pond. The second wash was actually named by Department of Environmental Quality. It was entitled the 27 Wash. I have no idea where they came up with that name. I'm certainly not 27. The, uh, the pond is located between holes nine and 10. The stream itself, or wash, then progresses down through holes eight, between the holes 18 and 10, then goes under Saddlebrook uh, Mountain View Boulevard. Now this is really key. When it goes under Mountain View Boulevard, it not only has by that time accrued runoff from the driving range, holes 18 and holes 10, but it be then begins to accumulate within the wash, the runoff from Mountain View Boulevard. If you'll take a look, there are two very large curb drains, one on the east lane and one on the west lane of Mountain View Boulevard. They uh, dump a considerable amount of water into that ephemeral stream or wash. It then progresses down by holes one and two down towards hole number three. Next slide. And when we get to hole number three, it then progresses further to a culvert that goes under uh, Sandcrest Road in the vicinity of where the junction is with Amberwood. From there, it then progresses outside the boundaries of Saddlebrook itself and paralleling Winding Trail Road down to Edwin Road. Those of you who use Edwin Road during a rainstorm have often gone through water or mud down there or dust or something else down there. That is the part of the outflow of Ephemeral Stream 27. It then crosses Edwin Road and goes into a drainage area near Capstan Road in Catalina. Next slide, please. The Audubon Society of Arizona took a look at the Sackett versus EPA decision by the Supreme Court. And when they did that, they found that uh, there was a little problem. The ephemeral streams, which had always been assumed were protected under the Federal Clean Water Act, are no longer protected under it. In fact, it was questionable whether they should have ever been protected under the Clean Water Act. Let's take now a look at uh, riparian areas. There are numerous definitions of riparian areas. In fact, uh, the term riparian itself is really fairly new in relationship to all of us, it's only 30 to 35 years old. So it's really like just a novice out there. The scientific community has come up with some definitions, but other agencies have different definitions as well, whether it's a legal one, a geographical one, or a landowner definition. Next slide, please. In background, the characteristics that you'll see here for the riparian area, that it's a transition area, as you can see here on the slide. 
these characteristics can make it habitat for various species. Next slide. Graphically, to give you an idea of what something like this looks like, you notice on this particular slide, it has to have these three integral parts. It has to have the flowing water, it's got to have the vegetation, and it's got to have the particular soil that is indigenous to that water area, not the uplands area from that. Next slide, please. The differences, the differences in the vegetation and landform of the geology are quite wide, as you can see on this slide. And one thing that you would probably notice, uh, this lot of the discussion about the San Pedro River. And the Tucson Water Department has a nicely developed riparian area to the southwest of Highway 10 that's open to the public to go into. So if you really have a question about riparian area, that's one to go to. But you, one of your key things is that you're going to have cottonwoods there for sure. Next slide, please. The definition of riparian for Arizona was further defined by the Arizona Riparian Act, which was passed in 1992, and further clarified by Arizona Council in 1994. And you can see that the term riparian is now defined as a vegetation habitat or ecosystems that are associated with bodies of water, streams, or lakes. The Arizona Revised Statute, next slide please. The Arizona Revised Statute for 4501 defines riparian areas a little bit further. It's, it, it points out that you've got some deep-rooted plants, but the thing I want to point out to you a little bit more directly is look at the last bullet there. It's within the adjacent or within or adjacent to a lake, pond, or marsh. that has natural water. Next slide, please. The amended Arizona revised statute uh, 4501 further defines re uh, riparian areas, in short, as adjacent to a body of water, but you can see the other sides up there, but look at the last bullet in particular. There di the terrain in the riparian area is different from the surrounding uplands. And by that, it means that the terrain, the dirt itself, that what we would call land or dirt or soil, is definitely different than what is up above. The vegetation is also different from what is up above. Next slide, please. Again, referring back to Arizona Revised Statute 45, dash 101, put more simply, you can see it on this slide. And notice the second bullet. At the present time, there is no state law that protects riparian areas, down to the maintenance or the protection of any riparian area. Next slide, please. You, the last thing of dealing with riparian areas that's very important to uh, take a look at, and that is that re ephemeral streams or washes cannot maintain or have embedded within it a riparian area under any circumstances. They're completely separate, and they will always have to be separate under the law. Next slide, please. So that, what does that mean to us here in Saddlebrook? It means a few things. Number one is that the runoff from the streets, open areas and golf courses, et cetera, that flow into a man-made drainage system are not riparian areas at all. Accumulation or ponding of water in the man-made constructed 
uh, swales here in Saddlebrook, they cannot be classified as riparian areas. And the areas that are identified, the washes that have been identified as ephemeral, cannot contain a riparian area. Not too long ago, a, uh, several residents presented a fish and game review tool. You can go to the next one. Okay. Tool dated the 6th, 23, uh, to the general manager. The general manager asked for some research to be done on that particular report. And it's, it's, it's interesting to note that in that report, the writer of the report designated the 27 wash, the ephemeral 27 wash, as a riparian area. Keep in mind, under state law, it cannot be a riparian, designated a riparian area. That's number one. The report itself contained three disclaimers. The first disclaimer said that it was a preliminary report, and we accept that. Two, that in order to do more, ref uh, to actually more, ref to better refine that report, biologists would have to be sent to the site and do an in-depth study. Again, keep in mind the state law 45, Arizona statute revised 45-101. The third disclaimer is more important and relevant to exactly what we're talking about today, and that is the location. The, uh, it turns out that the preparer of the report was totally responsible to make sure that he or she had the proper uh, geographical and topographical maps to take a look, and data to take a look and designate this for a preliminary study. Next slide. In taking a look at this one, the map on the left, the map on the left was from the report done by the Fish and Game Report. The map on the right is the latest map from the Department of Environmental Quality. The map on the left is dated approximately 1995, which means it's more than 30 years old and predates HOA 2. In fact, even the permitting for HOA 2. The map on the right is, the, as I say, it's the 1995 and shows Saddlebrook built out, the lower portion of Saddlebrook built out, recognizing the preserve is still being built out. Next slide. As we talk about that map information, this just reiterates what I was talking about. The drainage patterns are shown on the map. The, um, the ephemeral stream number 27, as it was shown on the latest map, is very small. It was not an overgrown area, not a well-developed area. When the developer, Robeson, built out HOA 2, under the, with the proper environmental and state permits, they were a, he was able to reconfigure, massively reconfigure the land to put in the roads, the lots, the drainage systems, the other facilities to include the golf course, Mountain View Country Club, etc. And it's under that that it's his also is the CCNRs, which we the owner, uh, homeowners have accepted as part of our deed, have to acknowledge that the HOA is respond, and we've talked about this earlier, the HOA must re uh, maintain the common areas and the facilities that are within the HOA owned areas. Part of that is the, are the streams, the drainage areas. All the drainage areas including the ephemeral areas, need to be maintained. If anything builds up, and that maintenance includes the removal of obstructions, growth, overgrowth for fallen trees, and et cetera, and keeping culverts clear. In summary, there is no, the, there is no, um, Wetland, there are no wetlands under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act in 
Saddlebrook. Number two, there are no riparian areas. Number three, yes, there's an ephemeral pond and two ephemeral streams or washes, both of which have been highly modified by the developer to provide maximum outflow of water sources from the golf courses, roads, and other areas within the HOA. Thank you. So hello, my name is Lynn Denning. I was on the original task force and returned with uh, three others to do research. And I, I want to just talk about the invasive species that we found. Prior to moving to Saddlebrook nine years ago, I uh, was in another state, nearby state. And after retiring, I went to a county extension office, was certified as a master gardener. And I served there for about 10 years on uh, hotlines. So we received calls from residents in the area. We never knew what we were going to be asked, and I really enjoyed it. Um, obviously, we did not always have all of the answers, but we had staff that we could go to if there was something that we did not know. So before I get into the presentation, I'd just like to reiterate what Eileen covered, and that is, in short, the common area is not a critical habitat for endangered or protected wildlife. We know that we do have cacti that are endangered, there are three of them, but since all cacti will be protected, they will automatically be saved. So let's talk about how we started working um, on the vegetation. We had no idea what was in the common area. So the first thing that we did was we took a lot of photographs and we had an excellent photographer on our team, Sharon Cotter, and she's sitting in the audience. Um, so we took turns going out with her, took photographs, and we sent them to two locations for help. We sent them to Pinal County, to the Extension Office, because we knew that there were people on the staff who could help us with ID. We also sent them to the Native Plant Society. And if you don't know about the Native Plant Society, it's a national organization with a very, very strong chapter in Tucson. After we did that, uh, one of the men who worked with us in the Native Plant Society, John Shearing, who has a PhD in agronomy, suggested touring our HOA. And so he did two tours with us, and members of our team went out with him, as well as the CAM management. Um, in the second tour, he brought a botanist with him, and he had over 40 years' experience uh, with botany. We also did extensive web research, and we also had conversations with the U of A. We knew that we had to eliminate noxious plants, and we worked with uh, the author of the noxious plant book for Arizona to be sure that we had up-to-date information. So let's look at what we found. The first one that we found, which is noxious and must be eliminated, and is our biggest threat, is buffalo grass. And if any of us were here during 2020, we know how devastating this is because it caused the fire to continue to burn. We started spraying. Uh, the HOA actually got a grant about, I guess, about two years ago. And with the grant, they were able to have uh, a team come in who were certified to spray, and they started spraying for buffalo grass. 
but we still have a lot more work to do and we can't stop in that area so we will need to continue budgeting for it. So some of the grasses I'm going to run through quickly. We found, uh, excuse me, fire hazard grasses. There were two, red brome and also London rocket. And red brome is to be eliminated by a dot. They're eliminating it all along the roadways. On Mountain View Boulevard, uh, as you come down Saddlebrook and turn to the right, it is inundated with Russian thistle. And Russian thistle, it's also called tumbleweed. It is noxious in Pinal, I'm sorry, in uh, Pima, but it is only invasive in Pinal. Why, I don't know. The other one on the right-hand side was um, a mistake. Um, it was brought in, um, and it's also on the ADOT list. I'd like to spend just a minute on desert broom, and I think most people in this room know what it looks like. It's uh, actually a native, and it's rampant throughout HOA2. It's very, excuse me, it's very, very difficult to control. And there's actually only one surefire method to control it, and that's to cut it down at the base. If you just cut it, it will simply grow back up, but it has to be painted with glyphosate. And you'll notice on the slide that the Scottsdale Fire Department has actually created an ordinance against it. And so we were very curious as to why they felt so strongly about it, and we talked to the fire marshals there. And they said, because it burns hot like petroleum. Tamarisk, which is salt cedar, falls in the same category. And this is also banned in Scottsdale. It is not a native, but it is uh, very invasive, and it destroys the chemistry of the soil. The one on the right is very controversial, creosote. People either love it or they hate it. And we had a lot of conversations on our team about it, some very strong opinions. So we finally went to the county extension agent and asked for a ruling on it. And the ruling to, uh, given to us was, if it is in a non-disturbed area, let it be. If it's in a disturbed area, then control it. So we're leaving that as a judgment call for a CAM. And just to comment on creosote and the way it multiplies, it can live in the soil for over 100 years, the root can. And there's a mother plant that sends out clones and creates a colony. So the clones will pop up, one here, one there, one there. And when that happens, because of what it does to the soil, it will literally kill whatever is in its path. I think most people in this room know what mistletoe looks like, but we did put it on the list because it seems to like our desert trees. And so we're asking Cam to control it. And that means actually cutting it out of the tree. We added um, a hybrid Palo Verde, the Mexican Palo Verde, to the list. When we toured with um, the Native Plant Society, we found it all over HOA2. And um, it, it's literally a nightmare for the CAM staff to maintain because it produces so many seeds. If it's over a homeowner's wall, it will dump a lot of debris on the homeowner's property. And so that is also on the list to, to hopefully eliminate. And it is listed in, as invasive in Arizona. We've added one other plant of concern, and that's the honey, honey mesquite. And if you look at the photo on the right, that is Mountain View hole number one after it was, uh, after it was mowed. And you see all the vegetation that has regenerated. That was taken about three to four weeks after the initial mowing. The reason we're concerned about it is because of the amount of regrowth. But it doesn't mean that it's a bad tree at all or a bad shrub. It has a lot of good qualities because this, the seeds are used by wildlife for food. It's one of three natives in Arizona. And the interesting part about it is it can grow as either a shrub 
or a tree, and it really depends on the soil and the amount of water that it receives. It is not on the invasive list, either Pinal, for Pinal or for Pima County. However, we are recommending that this one be uh, watched. So in summary, we know that in level five, we have a lot of invasives and they cover a very large part of level five. There are noxious and invasive species, some that I've shared with you, and they need to be eliminated to protect the plants. And if they aren't, if they aren't controlled, they will destroy cacti, which is a huge concern to us. So we believe that spot spraying, very targeted spot spraying, is going to be required to eliminate the invasives, but they're gonna to have to take care to protect the cactus. And one of the ones that's endangered is actually on the slide, it's the hedgehog that uh, Eileen mentioned we have found in multiple locations, and Cam has told us that they have also found it. So I'd like to leave this visual um, with you. The photo on the left is what will happen if creosote is not kept in check, and it will probably end up killing this prickly pear on the right. And the same is true of the prickly pear that's in the path of the Russian thistle, which is on Mountain View Boulevard. So that's the good, bad, and the ugly. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm Maureen Borland, and I was the chair of the original Common Area Task Force and um, was the one who pulled together these four who've continued to work with me on some of these issues over the last several years. Um, I'm gonna go through the recommendations from all of this that we're making to Walter and uh, obviously to the board who's here to, to hear it. Okay, our recommendations. All right. All right. Um, it's recommended that the residents Ooh, how did that move? Something moved here. We're having trouble with the, here it is. Okay, um, it's recommended that residents be notified prior to any start of level five work in their unit. And that would be done through the mon Monday message and through the unit reps. Uh, we want you to know when Cam is gonna be in your unit doing the level five work. Uh, the tr a trained supervisor, uh, we want them to review each area prior to beginning any of the work, to flag all of the healthy cacti, and identify the dead and diseased species that are to be removed. We want them to identify trees and bushes to be trimmed, and clarify trees and noxious and invasive species to be removed. Uh, crews would manually uh, trim identified trees and bushes as well as trim around the cacti and remove any of the uh, invasive things. A lot of you see these cacti all over the place with weeds growing up right in the middle of them that will kill them. Uh, we want the crews to remove noxious and invasive plants in the area, retain all healthy cacti, remove large debris or mulch to size comparable with purchased mulch. One of the complaints we heard from people is that the machine left the mulch, which was way too large, and big sticks. We don't want that. We want them to use the cat forestry mulcher, the big equipment that they have, as much as possible for the sake of efficiency so they can get through all of the level five area the first time because it's so overgrown. Uh, we want the crews to be cross-trained so that there's an ability to work on level simultaneously rather than it always at separate times. For instance, you have them come sometimes and do level four, but then they don't touch level five at the same time, so it leaves strips of places that are not being done in between and causes problems. We want clear expectations to be set for the crew so they're aware of what maintenance should look like in level five, and that's being worked on. We want a trained supervisor to review the area after the work is complete to make sure that it was done appropriately and to remove the flags on the protected cactus. Uh, this is what that looks like in uh, a system here. Start with notifying the residents, flag the healthy cacti, ID species to remove, trim trees and bushes, 
trim invasives that are near the cacti, use cat ventrac to re or the ventrac, which is another machine we have, to remove dead, diseased, and invasive species and mulch the trimmings. Review the area, collect the flags, and then go to the next unit. So it's a cycle that goes through in that process. Um, before we go back to actually doing the level five, and we have the board meeting on the 27th to decide on that, these are things that we think they can be doing immediately. It's recommended that the uh, endangered and threatened plants list be reviewed by the staff. The noxious and invasive weeds list be reviewed by the staff. Um, both of the above be identified within the common area so that the staff know what they look like and are well trained in that. Um, and we also think it would be helpful to contact someone familiar with cacti and invasive species, maybe, maybe from the Native Plant Society or something, so they can actually train the crew to identify both. Uh, we want the common area crew uh, to be trained to recognize weeds to eliminate and the proper way to spot, tray, uh, spot spray or paint uh, the cacti, uh, the weeds that need to be done. Staff should be con continue to be hired and trained, and that's an ongoing issue till we get to a full common area crew. Um, it's recommended that the common area crew tour level five common areas and replant the fish hook barrel cactus that have fallen over. You probably see a lot of them all over the place. Some will be able to be saved, some may not, but they should be replanting as many as they can. Uh, we want a method of marking cacti that are too small to see from the, the big cat mulcher um, so that the staff see them and aren't running over them. We want trees and bushes that are to remain in level five to be trim trimmed. Uh, we want inv invasive plants that have surrounded the healthy cacti to be trimmed out. We want maps identifying buffelgrass locations to be updated. We had... Uh, maps of where buffalo grass is in the community so that we could try to remove it. It needs to be updated because it's in a lot more places now than when we originally did it. Okay, uh, back again to the training. They should be, we actually developed, and Lynn did this, and I, I give her so much credit for this. She developed a research guide um, that actually has pictures of all of the plants and what needs to be done with them. And that can be used to train the staff. Um, we uh, want a spot spraying approach for licensed spray techs to be adopted. And uh, we want to address fire hazards, the ones that are primarily the fire hazards, like buffalo grass and desert broom, to be priorities for that. Um, Lynn has been working on uh, the Arizona FireWise standards. Uh, she's been learning it. Uh, th it's very clear, it's all recommended throughout the state of Arizona that um, all communities look at it and try to keep their maintenance so that it, it tries to prevent fires in communities. Um, I, some of you probably saw that in Scottsdale where they had that fire several months ago, that actually went up and scorched the walls of one of their HOAs. And that's why the Scottsdale Fire Department has become so involved in it. The cat forestry mulcher and the Ventrac both should be used. We know ben the Ventrac has not been used much because it's limited in how it can be used, but we're recommending that they take uh, a look at it and see how it can be used. And we actually want the, the Ventrac manufacturer to be contacted and request them to come and take a look at where it can be used in our community and if there are other attachments that would make it work better in some of our areas. Uh, it's recommended, this, these are our recommendations to Walter. It's recommended that the work in level five be resumed, but we continue to research new. <laughs> new and existing invasive species and monitor plant growth in level five areas. Uh, the HOA2 board, we, we're recommending commit, actually create a common area committee of residents on an ongoing basis, just like we tried to recommend that and did when, in 2019, 2020, but it didn't happen. Um, and we'd like, like to, um, say that the work within the common areas should be expanded to full implementation of each of the levels that's in the policy 
and um, we need to all the way up to level six and we need to be taking a multi-year approach to having that budgeted. Thank you. All righty, so thank you very much for that presentation. There was a lot of information provided. Thank you to the audience for still being here. <laughs> it's a lot of information and a lot of detail, so I do appreciate that you can imagine the research that they've done to put this together. So now we are going to move to my next slide. If it flips as fast as it did for art, we're done. <laughs> ah, okay, well. We're gonna go move to the questions, comment um, part of this meeting. So we're gonna open it up to the audience, the residents here. Again, like we do in most of our meetings, please identify yourself, um, what lot and unit you're from. You're gonna have a two minute time limit. So please, you don't try to squeeze in four minutes into the two minutes, okay? I've seen that before. And um, there's a link there that we'll provide um, after the meeting. We'll put that out electronically where other people, and those of you that are reviewing the video once that's out and available, can um, log in and actually make um, your comments. So with that, uh, just remind you that we're not here to argue with you. We're not here to argue with each other as residents if you have different views. I would like to keep this um, very civil and um, just come up and ask your question and make your comments. Thank you. Walter, can I make a quick statement? I assume, sure. hopefully as early as tomorrow, that these presentations will be online. So all homeowners will have the ability to go online and review these presentations uh, at your leisure, actually. Correct, we'll um, get the presentations and the marketing team's gonna get the video that we're recording. They'll put this all together and then put it out um, for access by the residents. Yes. Uh, we, get, we got a question way back here. So. Scott Brubaker, uh, Unit 17, Lot 22. We live on, I guess we're called the orphans, and our yard uh, is the Catalina number one. So do we expect two feet beyond our fence be taken care of by unit or by uh, HOA two, and the rest of it up to the cart path by uh, HOA one? And we're at the end of the hole, so uh, the cart path runs north to south, or uh, south to north, and then turns and goes west to east, who takes care of that side yard on the right? Okay, um, that's a good question, and in my mind, I can't actually imagine where you're talking about, but you notice that map that I showed up here that was very detailed? There is a map that covers your area, so um, what we need to do is actually, I guess if you could contact me, I can actually look up that map and show you exactly um, what will happen behind your house or on the side of it. My name is Sam Charles, and I'm a uh, unit 36, lot 42. Did you hear me? My name is Sam Charles. I live in unit 36, lot 42. I've been living in Saddlebrook approximately 22 years now. <laughs> yeah, just a little closer so we can hear. Okay. Is that loud enough now? Oh, All that's right. better. All right. I've been living in Saddlebrook for approximately 22 years now. And my wife and I uh, are in that horseshoe area of uh, holding the Missouri where the houses are. And we can see from our back wall directly to the T, straight path. I must 
commend the work that has been done already. That has been very nice indeed. And as was mentioned, the cleanup could have been better. It has been confronted, and I appreciate that too, because that was a concern of mine as well. The other concern that was not addressed is that the area that has been cleaned is fine, but beyond that there are many, many trees of all sorts, and they continue to grow and grow and grow. And when we bought that lot, uh, we were very concerned about the view and how wonderful it would be to have that, that view if it was properly maintained. Unfortunately, it has not been maintained. So I'm wondering if there's any future plans for that area. So right now, if I understand you right, that may be an area six. And the policy does have some type of um, work on area six, but I'm not gonna say it's clearing trees and stuff like that. It's mainly just low level type of maintenance. So at this point, I don't think we're funded to do what you're asking in level six. And I don't think it's covered by the level six policy. Hi, Dave Burgess, 46, lot five. Um, I like the detailed plan for reviewing what we need to do. But as we implement that, I think we need to look back. Uh, in an email in February 23rd, the board said they'll um, use the new equipment to allow for the destruction of the noxious and invasive weeds, yet care will be taken not to destroy cacti and other desired life. And an email from the board in June on the 16th, they put out that they're using a mulcher to eliminate noxious weeds, decaying plant life, etc. Care is being taken to keep the desert filled with the variety of cacti throughout the community. Trees are being trimmed, giving the desert a new look of beauty. Sounds wonderful. Sounds similar to the plan that was produced, except in more detail. However, the following week I contacted Elias from the common, I think he was acting manager of one of the CAM teams, and uh, he said his direction from the board, or from his management actually, was to basically clear everything, leave a few trees, and that's what he was doing. So I don't understand. There's obviously a communication breakdown where if the board says one thing, but the staff is implementing something else. I mean, they basically were clear, clearing the whole thing, leaving a few cactus and a few trees. So, I, you know, I think whatever recommendations we can have to be clearly communicated and someone needs to follow through. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Hi, Stephanie Nordlin, Unit 14, Lot 110. In 2017, we purchased our home. There were two trees in the green space behind our yard. There were cacti, various wildflowers, and other bushes uh, growing in level five behind the house. That's from the entire width of our backyard. Okay, since then, in 2019, when we came back from being a snowbird at that time, the entire level four and five be behind our property since then has repeatedly been raised, leaving nothing. I've walked the area and found cacti run over by heavy equipment. I found 10 tree stumps in the back. This spring, I was delighted because there was a Palo Verde in the center of that area, which is the most view we get from our yard, blooming. It was bigger than I am, taller, and it was multi-stumped. And yet, when you came through behind our house, level five, it was hacked down along with a two foot tall cho choya and other things. The bare earth is ugly. 
It is an ecosystem eyesore, and it's a problem. The neighbor's yard or fence is cracking, and it is, in effect, lessening the value of our home. All right. Thank, thank you for your, for your comment. Um, I definitely want to go, go look at that. Um, we, would, we haven't actually started level five up in that unit, so um, I'd have to come look and see. Uh, the unit 14. We haven't even gone up there with level five yet, so we'll have to, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm interested in that one to see what, what was going on, so thank you. Ready? Jim Lanford, unit 44A, lot 55. I want to talk to everybody about their wallet, okay? A, a new neighbor of mine approached me recently and, and asked me about insurance, and he said he had a tough time getting insurance because of all the overgrowth and kindling that was in the common area of the area. And they would not, all state turned them down, State Farm turned them down, several other ones turned them down because of all the stuff around his house or close to his house that was in the common area. So I immediately went home and called my all state agent. And he said, yeah, we're doing that. And he's over here in Oracle, he's, he's written a million policies in Saddlebrook and so on. And he said, also, we're not renewing a lot of policies in Saddlebrook because of that. So he checked in, in my, they ever, I think it's every five years they come out and physically inspect your property to see if they're going to keep renewing it. Mine's not due for two more years. But he told me that if, if they find substantial growth or kindling in the common area close to my house, they will deny renewal of my policy. So what's your options? High risk policy, three, four times of what your premium you're paying and a deductible that's outrageous. This is your option. So you talk about if people can't get insurance, your property values are really going to drop more than that, ladies. And then, you know, what, what do you got? You got low property values, you can't sell your house, and you're paying ridiculously high insurance premiums all because you won't take care of the property, the common area properly. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, Jim had mentioned to me um, in passing that this was going on, so I tried to call the insurance company. I didn't get a hold of anybody yet, so I, see, I definitely do need to talk to them to see you know, what they're looking at and how that's going to affect the community. So thanks, Jim, for bringing that up. Thank you. My name is Keith Schiller, Unit 44A, um, Lot 7. I would like to compliment your uh, work. I was really impressed. I hadn't heard the depth of what you've done. I'm not going to put a but on this. Um, Really, really good. Um, I would say that implementing what you've said is going to be important. That's really the key. Communication, but getting it done. It's not only getting it done for what Jim has pointed out, dealing with insurance. But I could say getting it done is important to avoid later litigation over the diminution of value for people who have view lots. In California, the principle is called inverse condemnation. And that's when an agency or uh, someone with, with authority fails to act or acts in a way that reduces the value of, of property. So it's important to have the trees appropriately trimmed. And I'm saying this as an environmentalist. I've raised tens of millions of dollars in California for conservation and environmental programs. I'm sensitive to the concerns folks have about species and birds and all of, and all of that and it is important. But this was also a desert. So it's not going to be pure. This is a different environment, but it was a desert, and it didn't have those. So what the key is, is to implement that hard work that you have done, but to get it done. Procrastination is not our friend. It's not the friend for the HOA members, and it's not the friend of the residents. Thank you. Larry Miller, Unit 47, Lot 34. Uh, first of all, I'd like to add to what the other gentleman said about the insurance. Uh, I was trying to get new insurance through Progressive for the home. They wouldn't insure my home. They say we're in a high fire risk area, okay? And uh, speaking of that, I live along the natural wash. I'm in 47. 
my yard uh, backs up to the natural wash and uh, I, I've always felt there's a bit high fire risk living where I do. And you, you know the winds we get and you know that ambers, embers rather, can, can go miles. So this thing about, oh, you're 30 feet away, you're safe. Well, I got news for you. Anyway, uh, with going along with that, is there any priority going to be given to what areas should be done first? Because I think where I'm at is a high priority area. Because being on that wash between, you know, uh, Eagle Crest and, and, and us. Rather than doing the golf courses and stuff, they're not going to burn down. Okay? This, the main wash and the other washes are going to catch fire before anything else. So I appreciate all your, the work you've done. Uh, and it sounds like that uh, you're allowed to do what you originally planned. So let's go for it and get it done. No. Yeah. So they're allowed to. No, all right. They just told you thank, that. Thank you. My name is Phil Knoll. I live on Unit 29, Lot 67. Appreciate the work of the board. Appreciate the work that's been done. I only have one question, and I see a lot of reference to tree trimming. Are there guidelines for tree trimming? I haven't heard any. And uh, I'd like to know what it's supposed to look like when you're done. Uh, right now, we didn't dive into specific tree trimming, but that's something that we can include in, in the training. It's something that we need to be aware of also. Martha Golick, 7323. Um, I have a lot of creosote behind me, so I'm wondering what your definition is of um, disturbed and undisturbed area. And do we, for the people that, in a certain block, that have creosote behind them, can they determine whether it stays or it goes? Okay, so in the briefing, I believe they said that that would be up to the common area supervisor to decide on if it's undisturbed or disturbed area. What is the so, definition of disturbed yeah. and undisturbed? Um, I don't have that right now. That's, again, part of the training that they're recommending is where we would have to determine that. So before, that, before it's taken out, would residents be able to have a say with the manager whether that creosote, so if the creosote behind me is taken out, I have dirt. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's a bush, it's a tree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we have an opportunity when you know that the level five is gonna be done in your area, you have the opportunity to communicate with us. Okay, so. okay. Another mm -hmm. concern that I had is I did talk with people who um, have used heavy equipment, like the heavy equipment that was purchased, and they have told me that it's impossible to discriminate between cactus, live cactus, and noxious plants, that the equipment is just too large. So that's a concern to me. Yes. Um, you know, it's... Right. Hi. My name is Diane Smith. I live in Unit 29, Lot 18. I moved here six years ago, and... Oh, before I get into that, I really am impressed with all the work that the committee has done and the board. And I wake up every day happy to be here. But um, six years ago when I moved in, I had clear, unobstructed views of the Catalina Mountains straight up to Mount Lemon. And I was just in awe. I, I, I couldn't believe my good fortune. I'm on a premium lot, and my Pinell County taxes reflect that. I pay higher taxes for this. Well, in the course of six years, nothing has been done behind my back wall. To the extent that I have a mesquite tree that now covers the entirety of the prime area of my viewing up to Mount Lemon. What I'm really concerned about is, on September 6th of last year, I submitted a written request with photographs of what is going on behind my wall a year ago. Nothing has been done. Nothing. And I'm really upset. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a complainer. I'm, a, I'm not a whiner. 
I'm a can-do kind of person, but I just really am appalled that the staff for the common area maintenance is so unresponsive. I've been given false information. I don't know if it was deliberately misleading. I've seen other work done south of me on, Gran on South Granite Crest Boulevard, which is what I live on, where trees have been trimmed. Why not my tree? <laughs> so I just really, this whole implementation is only as good as the staff who's going to be implementing it and the communication they have with homeowners. So that's my concern. Thank you. So can, can you tell me your lot and unit again? My, Diane Smith, unit 29, lot 18. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ed Bergen. I'm a unit 25, lot 30. Thank you so much for all the research. That was a treat. A lot of the concerns last time revolved around that. Thanks for all you dug in. And thanks for all the work that's happening on getting rid of some of the uh, real fire hazards with the grass that can go up just like that, the buffalo grass, etc. <clears throat> Still have a few other concerns, though. Valley fever has been in the newspaper fairly times, several times recently. And it seems like with our really heavy equipment, we're just constantly churning the soil. And I'm concerned about releasing all the, what? I don't know if the bacteria or who they are, but they, they get us with the... The vote is spores. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then another comment. Your policy is fabulous. I've liked reading it. I was in, I'm still supportive of it. But then when I see implementation, what I've seen so far, trees, some trees get trimmed, many get removed. Some cacti are allowed to live, and the bushes are gone. I'd really appreciate pruning and trimming and selectively removing, but not just clear-cutting. And at that point, boy, I'd vote to get rid of the big monster machine and get a couple smaller ones, a couple more workers. <laughs> I think what it really comes down to is we all love the place. We all want it to be beautiful as we look around. And to see it ravaged is really tough. And I appreciate you seeing that we're not killing, we don't have invasive, not, we don't have protected species, animal or plant, but boy, let's protect the environment nonetheless to have it look attractive so our property values don't drop through the floor and so we can go on enjoying the place. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ron Robertson. I'm in uh, Unit 36, Lot 63. Uh, I've been a resident there, my wife and I have, uh, for 19 years. And we've seen all of this take place in the last 19 years, like some of these people have, have described. <clears throat> uh, I'm in the last lot that was done in that particular area, and they did a terrific job. Um, they, Clean it up the way you would think it would be done, and they particularly left the cacti that I pointed out to them. So I'm very pleased with everything they've done. At this point, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to them continuing from uh, my lot towards uh, Rangewood is a forest uh, <clears throat> overhanging in people's uh, yard. Uh, it's a tremendous fire danger there, as well as the pack rat stuff and all that. But anyway, all you guys are, and ladies are doing a great job. Keep it up, and there's a lot of us out here that want you to keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Bruce Allison. <clears throat> uh, 36 and 210. Uh, I had about a three-fourths of a page. I didn't realize that you guys were going to answer so much of it. I'm glad you did. I have a question. We never received a map. I don't know whether that's just for Unit 36 or what. <laughs> my, my other question, how many crews do you think you have to do this work? 
Okay, so the maps should be available. If not, we've got to get them back out to you. And um, I can communicate with your unit reps to have them re-engage and pick up these maps. We okay, can that's copies. good. Um, in terms of crews, during the budget build in for the 2023 budget, um, we went with just two members right now because we're in the process of trying to implement this and figure out how we're going to do this. So again, this, is whole, this whole implementation process is something new that we're trying, um, but we had to stop. So right now we have two members. One is a driver of the machine and the other one is to clean up and do more of the little details. Um, so that's what we have right now in the budget and staffed for. So if I understand it, you're between number two and three whole. Is that the sequence you're taking? right down the line from hole four, five, and et cetera? So right now, um, we, don't we didn't necessarily, necessarily set specific priorities. We were getting started. We said, okay, let's, let's get started somewhere and start learning how to implement this. So you know, right now, we do not have a set stated priority. We were just going, you know, like you're saying, down the line, trying to um, figure out the best way to implement this process. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious. what how much time you think it's going to take to do this whole whole area so I we mean, it's a massive project it's a massive project we calculated um, when we did the budget that we would need a four-man team with that piece of equipment to it's going to take us longer than um, a year on our first pass because there's so much to do but once we get all this 25 years of overgrowth um, cut down the second round as we come back through our goal is to be able to make it in one year and you see how much progress we made in just three weeks we went through three holes of the golf course um, so we were moving pretty good okay keep up the good work <laughs> <laughs> thank you I'm Vicki Streif uh, lot 7, Unit 27. This is a brain trust right here. They know what they're doing. They did the homework. It's fabulous. I can't understand why, when that plan was turned in, we're here not months later, but years later. And I just want to say that you had a lady who worked at Saddlebrook when we moved here 13 years ago. Her name was Cindy Hinkle. She knew how many crew members it took for Robeson to maintain the common areas effectively. She knew what equipment it took. And she knew what the rotational patterns were to do it on a regular basis. She left. Cindy Hinkle probably lives somewhere and some genius could find her and get the answers to these things. No, they did not have giant equipment that mowed down everything. They had manpower. They had crews on a rotation, and they knew what the heck they were doing. Until that happens and is made available again, I can't see how you're going to do what you need to do. That's all I have to say. I thank you for coming and taking care of the wash, Lake Streif, we called it, and you came and fixed that part. But somebody came and did something in Area 5 for part of our unit, but the area behind us was not touched. It's a problem, folks. It's a challenge, and I know you're all up to the job. Thank you. Yes, uh, Ann Hilton, Unit 44A, we're pretty well represented here. Uh, lot 25, and I applaud the work you did. It was fabulous. And I would just ask the other residents um, in HOA 2 to understand that since this hasn't been done for so long, and if we're gonna get it done within budget, and we're gonna get it done in a reasonable amount of time, we're gonna to have to use the equipment we have. And so once we get through it completely, you all can start worrying about whether you have a bush or you have whatever. 
but the noxious weeds, the uh, volunteer mesquites that have just taken over, and all the things that we've talked about around insurance and fire and for some of us views and other issues, we've got to move on. So please, board, let's go. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dawn Cleary, and I live in Unit 30, Lot 48. Thank you so much for showing up and being willing to listen to all of us. We really appreciate that. Um, I have a question about level four. We have two mature trees that are like one foot on the other side of our fence. And they've been there for a long time, obviously 20 years. And they haven't never been touched before. And I'm really hoping they won't get touched this time either, just because they provide shade and hummingbird nests and all of that sort of thing. So if something hasn't been touched in level four before, is there, there's no change in policy for that? Is that true? Uh, currently, there is no change in the level four policy. Okay. However, I'm not going to guarantee you that that won't come in the future. Just, just uh, being honest with you. Okay. Um, regarding level five, because we're in unit 30, we have this really steep hillside behind us that is our view. Um, I really understand people who have views that have been impinged by trees. But the trees are our view. We have a beautiful mesquite that the deer like to lay under and the bunnies run around. And yeah, I'm one of those people. Anyway, um, I just worry that if we really take out all the plants that that hillside is gonna end up in our backyard and in our family room. And I would like to speak on behalf of those who cannot speak, all of the creatures who find shade and sustenance and homes and the trees in our open space, and I hope that they can be considered as well. Thank you. I know level 30 and the hill you're talking about, so I'm aware of that. Paula Arnold, unit 44A, lot 19. We have been in our home for about a year and a half now, and uh, have seen the common area change a lot just in a year and a half with the growth. I appreciate everything that you've done as research here, and I'm very happy that this many people came today. Uh, it'd be great if the board meetings were like this. <laughs> and I would like to hope that the board of directors will use this situation, this emotional issue, as a learning piece that when there are major functions going to happen in our community that this kind of research is presented to the homeowners with the hopes that they want to come and be informed before the fact. I think that there are things that happen in the community that we aren't necessarily aware of because things just happen and people are busy and they can't get involved. And I think that if this kind of forum is available to people before the fact, then they have nobody to blame but themselves for not coming and being informed. I love having the board meetings online. I listen to them while I'm doing other things because I can multitask that way. And I learn a lot. So I'm thankful that the meetings are available online. Um, and, and I think that people who complain need to be the ones that come to the meetings to find out the when and why and whatever. So uh, I commend the board for all the work and I hope that just like my neighbors and behind me says, get it going. Thanks, Paula. And in defense of the task force and board, in past years we have done a lot of this information and it has been out there, especially when we developed the maps and things like that. So there were opportunities in the past to see this information. All right, thanks. Hi, my name's Greg Shin. I'm in uh, unit 42, lot 54. Um, I'm also a landscape architect, and I've, I've sent, Dan sent you some information. 
Um, you guys did a great job. Your research answered a lot of my questions. The issue that I see is again what some other people have said, which is implementation. The idea that a piece of machinery this, uh, this wide can differentiate between a cactus here and a shrub right next to it, that's a little bit naive to think that. Um, Walter, I'm gonna send you pictures I have in our area, which is level six, of them mowing down cactus um, to get to level four. So it's not happening quite the way you want, um, but I think that your plan is, is uh, I'm happy with the plan at this point. The other issue I'd like to comment on, we're, we're scraping some of these areas with the idea that the good stuff will come back. Well, when you scrape an area that has buffalo grass or thistle or any of the other noxious weeds in it, you're also spreading those seeds. You're getting them into your equipment and then your equipment moves to another area that is perhaps not full of buffalo grass, not full of invaders. And now, instead of getting rid of it, we're actually spreading it. And buffalo grass, it's another word for fire. And maybe the idea is spray first, flag all the, the stuff we want to stay, then come back with the equipment and work with the equipment to keep what you flagged and pull out the dead material. Thank you. Thank you. All right, hi there. My name is Lori Benden. I live in Unit 30, Lot 49. Don is um, my neighbor. Um, thank you for your work, Walter. Thank you for listening to me at other times. Um, my address is, uh, it's on East Desert Peak. Uh, and I'd like to say, uh, we have a steep hill um, behind us, behind our wall, and then there's the community on top of the hill that doesn't belong to Saddlebrook. We've got Lago del Oro over on our right, and the animals use our backyard between communities as this little animal highway to go to the um, golf course for water, grass, or to continue on on their nat nat nature trail in Catalina. So what I'd like to emphasize is that our unit, Unit 30, behind Desert Peak, and then Unit 23 and 25, um, it, the wildlife area behind our wall, we understand there's a 10-foot fire break wall, and we understand that needs to be clear, and uh, we don't have a problem with that. Uh, after the fire lane, the land, uh, that hill rises up actually 45, 90 degrees straight up. Um, there are mesquite trees, cactus bushes, large rocks. It's a scheduled uh, level five, 30 feet. However, um, there are boulders, there are some dead trees, there are live trees. There are deep crevices established by the monsoon rains. When those rains hit us, it comes all down the hill. It hits our wall, it goes towards Lago del, del Oro, but it's a deluge and um, even the dead plants and trees and the dead root systems are holding that hill uh, together. Um, do, let me see, sorry. So my concern, along with the animals using this uh, kind of privately is the structural stability of the hill. Uh, Lori, Lori? What? Um, after you, you had mentioned, um, after we had talked at the coffee, I went back and I looked at the area you're talking about. So I'm, I'm familiar with it. I walked behind your house, again, back in the unit 30. So I know exactly what you're talking about. So right. yes, um, I'm concerned with that too. And that's something that I will um, talk with the common area about. Okay, thank you, thank Walter. You. It's just this level five I find um, is too severe, uh, and I, I really hope you reconsider certain areas. Thank you. Thank you. We've got one more. I know this has to be lower for me. I'm Penny Maloney. I've been in Saddlebrook 27 years. In this part, six years, I live in Unit 23101. The thing I'm asking about is, and I have written about it, no one's ever answered me, is the lack of care 
of that area right where you drive in to our clubhouse. I know it well because I have a dog, so I walk there. And it has been neglected. And I've talked to the people that are hired to mow the grass, and they say this is all we can do, and we have to dump it in there. All the pine cones go in there. Oh, okay. All the pine cones go in there. It's a mess. Okay, we, I know. I know. Um, this this meeting's about level five, and I know oh, the area. Oh, we can't talk about any. No, else. we want to focus. This town hall is on level five, but okay. I I know I know the area you're talking about, yeah. and again, that's something I just I can, thought since they had spent all their time making these yeah. plans for everything. It isn't showing yeah. there, and that's uh, the entrance to yeah. our place. Thank you. I've got I've got it noted, so I know what area you're talking about. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, thank you. No more mm -hmm. answers. And <laughs> we got we got about five more minutes here because I don't want to go too much past four o'clock. My name is Sherry Groupie, uh, Unit Forty Five, Lot Seventy Three. First, I'd like to thank everybody for being here and for holding this town hall and for all of your efforts and research and the plan is good the plan has been the last plan was good <laughs> this plan is even more detailed and even better so thank you for putting your work together and for doing that my concern is the because of what happened when the last implementation of that plan you're talking about going in and trimming and pruning and spraying and all good We've got issues, it needs to be taken care of. I think everyone can agree with that. But the concern is, once again, with the very large equipment, you cannot get the surgical trimming that you're talking about doing. So you would also, so I'm concerned about that still. We'll wait and see. Hopefully you can, <laughs> because we like the plan. Um, the other thing you talked about was having somebody go through first and flag and you know what's to go what's to stay have you determined who will do that at this point is that a new hire is that someone on staff that will be trained do we know that yet um, we do not have that person identified yet again um, the information and recommendations that they have given me I need time to review those and see how to address okay. that okay I think that would be great to have somebody do that I think that's important I think it's also important that we have some oversight on that. So after it's done, are we following the plan? And if what adjustments do we need to make? Maybe there won't be any, I hope there's not. Um, but I think that would also be an important factor. Okay. And I'm almost out of time. I do have a question. The map online for the community, the area map, is that correct? Say that again. The map for the common area maintenance map online on the SB2 site, is that correct? I believe it is. I believe I posted. I'll have to check to make sure, you know, with okay. this new website and stuff, I want to double check to make sure that that's the map. Okay. And there's more detailed, but your unit reps need to come get the detailed maps. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just, it's very different. A lot of what was done was done in level six, according to the map. So that was, once again, the disconnect that I was wondering about. So maybe okay. it's the map. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm saying you're the last one since we're two minutes to, <laughs> two minutes to four o'clock. Best for last, right? Uh, Mona Devine, this is low, uh, unit 45, lot 100. Uh, implementation is the key, obviously, and I won't go over all the stuff, but I think you did a great job on the rules and the regulations and all those things. But I didn't see any criteria for uh, spacing and tree removal and obviously people enjoy their views but two safety things we have to have some flexibility if they come through and they just start removing all volunteer trees because we've lost some important landscape trees particularly along the golf course that protects some of our homes from golf balls uh, for instance on uh, my hole there was a huge landscape tree that was obviously planned to protect on slices that came down in that storm so in those cases, maybe some lands, uh, some volunteer trees need to be allowed to grow. So if you flag things ahead of time, I hope that you'll really consult with folks that live near there for those safety reasons. Second one, coming from a, a extensive wildfire management, exotic weed management, hazard tree removal, work experience, uh, be careful about how much grass you create. I know people say, oh, it's growing back, and look at this grass. Grass is a fine, flashy fuel. 
it can be much more hazardous than what we have now if we're not careful. So as you look at that, be sure to weigh those factors for you for your safety and also for aesthetics. Thank you. Okay, so it's four o'clock. How quick is your comment? <laughs> okay. Uh, Allison Lang, Unit 14, Lot 176. Um, I just want to um, mention the comment that no permits were necessary. If you're going to use the CAT, Pinal County requires you pull a dust permit, possibly a water truck, for every 10 acres you work in and you have to ID the parcel number you're working in. Right, Walter? I know that um, on construction sites, a dust permit is actually required. I do not know how that applies to maintenance of landscaping. Well, I, I can tell you I was on, I was. All right, that was not my understanding. Oh. An incorrect in that a dust permit is required. The community was charged with one, which I have here. It's $400 for the dust permit. It's for every single parcel. It is for the common area maintenance. They came out to see it. Where, Where on Mountain View? Mm -hmm. And I have the permit, the price, and that they can, require a water truck when that. Okay, can you, um, I guess, provide a copy to me so I can see Absolutely. what you're talking about? Yeah. So. I, th I would thought you would have had one by now. <laughs> yeah. Because they're concerned, I think, about the dust for people's lungs, certainly in health, and that and may also the yeah, be related to an actual construction project. No, it was not. It was for the common area maintenance, specifically okay. Mountain okay. View Okay, we're, we're past four o'clock and I wanna wrap this up and um, just thank you for coming out and thank you for your comments. Again, I will be looking for other comments online and I do appreciate your time today. So have a good afternoon. Oh, thanks for yeah, bringing that up. It's not the table art. It's the bottom of the water. I am. This is so uneven that it goes. See, like this is up here and down here.